Dave, how did we meet? It was probably through Storm. I think everything and... good happens through Storm Glory. <laughs> because of the uh, conference, the, oh my gosh, we can't leave our houses, we need to talk to people conference, right? <laughs> Or the first of two years of the Amplify Music Conference, which Storm and I created um, when we got stuck not getting together for South by in 2020. Right, right. When we wanted to bring people together, and we thought, eh, it's just a few weeks' notice. We, you know, we'll, we'll drag people together. And you quickly came to the fold. So that's how we first met. And um, can you explain to our wonderful listeners and viewers on the YouTube channel what you do, and then we'll go down the rabbit hole of how you got here. Sure. Uh, I'm an attorney, and so I run a law firm called the Creative Law Network. And so our law firm is focused on providing legal services to creative people and businesses. That is the short And we version. were talking, and you said, no one's been on the show to talk about the legal side of all this and how innovation ties in with laws. I'm so glad you suggested that. And so glad that we're able to kind of deepen our conversation after a couple of years of bumping into each other digitally exactly. and actually not in person, which is a, some of the funds of the interwebs. Right. So you are in Colorado, in Denver proper? Uh, Office is in Denver. And uh, yeah, we, the thing is, as even before the pandemic, but certainly now, we represent people that are everywhere. Uh, and it's a wonderful ability to do that. Uh, I'm licensed to practice law in Colorado and in New York. Not in beautiful California. No, it's a little tougher in California. You guys, you can keep a tight ship there. Can't just, uh, you don't just let anybody state. in. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> so, so um, were you, I, I tend to drag people back into kid and teenagehood. Were you a kid that was interested in related fields? Were you a musician? Were you... Uh, someone who loved to poke into stuff. What was what was the young Dave like? I certainly loved music. I can't say that I was a great musician, and that will definitely that ties into the path I took to get here. Uh, but certainly, always into music and video. I mean, my brother and I used to make little videos and do lip syncing, karaoke, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I I did play trombone, but not particularly well. And so it seems like the music genes, my brother actually does play in a band some of the time now, uh, and a dad band, you know, but, uh, but it was always, I've music never was... heard the term dad band before. Oh, very popular in the suburbs. Absolutely. Dad band. Uh, <laughs> so, like man uh, caves and dad bands. Okay. And really, uh, always was very much into music and media. And then when I started going to see live music, that really lit a fire because the, the live experience is, is so visceral, can be so much fun, can be so enlightening, um, and is generally enjoyable. So, so uh, when that... you say music, what bands, mm -hmm. what type of music, what was your jam? It's funny you say jam. Uh, I started listening to the Grateful Dead when I was 10 years old. Um, oh, wow. and yeah, so that, uh, it, the the path was usually, I saw a lot of Grateful Dead shows, I saw a lot of fish shows. I... Dave, how did we meet? It was probably through Storm. I think and... everything good happens <laughs> through Storm Glory. <laughs> because of the uh, conference, the, oh my gosh, we can't leave our houses. We need to talk to people at conference, right? <laughs> or the first of two years of the Amplify Music Conference, which Storm and I created um, when we got stuck not getting together for South by in 2020. Right, right. When we wanted to bring people together and we thought, eh, it's just a few weeks notice. We, you know, we'll, we'll drag people together. And you quickly came to the fold. So that's how we first met. And um, can you explain to our wonderful listeners and viewers on the YouTube channel what you do? And then we'll go down the rabbit hole of how you got here. Sure. Uh, I'm an attorney. And so I run a law firm called the Creative Law Network. And so our law firm is focused on providing legal services to creative people and businesses. That is the short and we version. were talking and you said, no one's been on the show to talk about the legal side of all this and how innovation ties in with laws. I'm so glad you suggested that. 
And so glad they're able to kind of deepen our conversation after a couple of years of bumping into each other digitally exactly. and actually not in person, which is a, some of the funds of the interwebs. Right. So you are in Colorado, in Denver proper? Uh, Office is in Denver. And uh, yeah, we, the thing is, as even before the pandemic, but certainly now, we represent people that are everywhere. Uh, and it's a wonderful ability to do that. Uh, I'm licensed to practice law in Colorado and in New York. Not in beautiful California. No, it's a little tougher in California. You guys, you can keep a tight ship there. Can't just, uh, you don't just let anybody state. in. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> so, so um, were you, I, I tend to drag people back into kid and teenagehood. Were you a kid that was... Interested in related fields? Were you a musician? Were you uh, someone who loved to poke into stuff? What was what was the young Dave like? I certainly loved music. I can't say that I was a great musician, and that will definitely that ties into the path I took to get here. Uh, but certainly, always into music and video. I mean, my brother and I used to make little videos and do lip syncing, karaoke, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I, I did play trombone, but not particularly well. And so it seems like the music genes, my brother actually does play in a band some of the time now, uh, and a dad band, you know, but, uh, but it was always, I've never heard the term dad band before. Oh, very popular in the suburbs. Absolutely. Dad band. Uh, (laughs) So... Like man uh, caves and dad bands. Okay. And really uh, always was very much into music and media. And then when I started going to see live music, that really lit a fire because the, the live experience is, is so visceral. It can be so much fun, can be so enlightening, um, and is generally enjoyable. So, so uh, when that... you say music, what bands, mm-hmm. what type of music, what was your jam? It's funny you say jam. Uh, I started listening to The Grateful Dead when I was 10 years old. Um, oh, wow. And yeah, so that uh, it, the, the path was usually I saw a lot of Grateful Dead shows. I saw a lot of fish shows. I saw a lot of string cheese incident and widespread panic. And that led to me getting working in the music industry come my mid-20s. Um, so I think as, as a younger kid, it was very much in uh, top 40 you know, the Casey Kasem countdown, um, if that doesn't date me too much. Uh, I was going to say, my commenting on that would date me as well. Where did you grow up? <laughs> I grew up in New York. So that that then led you to Cornell? Yes? No? Yes. So I, yeah, I grew up in downstate New York. I went to undergrad at Cornell. Uh, I graduated Cornell and packed my car and drove straight to Colorado. I mean, if you asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have told you I wanted to be a ski bum. And so <laughs> the first thing to do was to go make sure I skied as much as possible before um, getting a real job. Cornell. So to speak. It's just not really. Oh, big I did slopes. it. I, I was on ski team four years at Cornell and, and four years in high school as well. But I, I, I can't recommend it after you've skied out west. Um, it's great. Uh, don't get me wrong. I, it, it's, it's really I learned icy. great things. It's a mm-hmm. different sort of thing. It may, it mm-hmm. train, I will say that skiers who grow up skiing on the East Coast are great skiers wherever they land elsewhere. Um, but I wanted a little bit more, um, a little more in the ski world. So yeah, so I moved to Colorado. Uh, I lived in Telluride and I just skied every day um, for a few years. And then after doing that for a few years, realized I'd better get out of there. I would never get out of there and moved to Boulder, Colorado. And in Boulder, <laughs> and that's that much different. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, I thought I was moving to the real world by moving to Boulder, because Telluride uh-huh. is definitely not the real world. Uh, and Boulder certainly provide a lot more opportunities. I got uh, a, a number of jobs. This is current dot com days, end of the the nineties, and so had a number of jobs in the dot com world. And by uh, two thousand and one, I was working for actually a great company. I was. Um, at, at my age, had a good job with benefits and a salary. And, uh, I said to myself, I don't care about this work at all. I'm sitting at a computer all day and I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. And therefore I quit. And being the idealistic 20 something that I was, I said, okay, I want to do something I'm passionate about. What am I passionate about? I'm passionate about skiing. 
I'm passionate about music. I've already done the skiing thing, so I'll try music. And uh, as I said, I was very much in the jam band scene at that time, so I called up my favorite band in Boulder at the time and said, I want to work for you. And they said, well, you could like make sure our CDs are in stores in the towns that we're going to play in. And I said, I want to do something full time. I really want to sink my teeth into this. And they said, okay, well, come out on the road with us. You can sell merch and basically be a roadie. And so I literally got on the bus uh, and started selling t-shirts and CDs and, um, and hauling gear. And I learned to drive the bus. So I was driving the bus around the country. And uh, it's a great way to learn about the music industry, to be on the road and just be out there doing that day in and day out. And after doing it for a while, the, the band didn't have a tour manager at the time. So I and it basically adopted the tour manager role and started really planning out the tours and making sure we've got all our hospitality, et cetera, set up. And uh, basically after doing that for a while, the band was self-managed and didn't have a manager. And I started taking on management duties. And so I became over time, became their manager. And after managing and tour managing and trying to do this all on the road when we didn't have iPhones and we didn't have all the Wi-Fi everywhere. It was quite challenging. Um, I would spend my nights in Kinko's printing out posters and shipping posters and handbills all over the country. And I got off the road. I set up an office in Boulder. I started managing other bands. Uh, and so started a little management agency. And again, learned a lot more just by doing it. Uh, and, and shared an office space with other managers and agents, some merchandise folks. And so again, had a great community around me to help me learn uh, my way around the industry. And um, basically- From beautiful Boulder. From beautiful Boulder. And, and also where there's so much live music coming through. We've got a lot of venues in Colorado, uh, a lot of talent in Colorado. And so it was a really great place to be, uh, especially at that time. And, uh, and really be able to interact with folks on a lot of different levels and still go out on the road when needed, as and managers do. And skiing occasionally. Yeah. That did happen. Yes, that, that did happen. happen. Yeah, there fun. was there there was some skiing, uh, and really. Did this then lure you into law? So, the thing about being a manager is, you get handed contracts. Yeah. And you suddenly need a lawyer to read those contracts, and there was one lawyer in Colorado that I knew that understood the music industry, and she's wonderful, but she was one person. And I realized what I love about being a manager is I am helping musicians. I am helping artists with their business. The artists can go make art. I can run the business, right? They can go play music. I can handle the emails and the marketing and the business and the contracts. And basically realized I could do more for artists if I had this law degree and actually knew what I was doing around contracts. And also learn so much more about the rights and the publishing and the labels and all these other things that can be a little hard to grasp um, at the initial stages. So I ended up closing up shop and going to law school and realizing that there's all these things and you learn these things in law school, all these different things apply about your contracts class and your intellectual property law and uh, rights of publicity and all these other things so that when I got out of law school, I was able to go and start representing artists. And that expands not only to just music, but a lot of these same legal concepts apply throughout the creative industries. So it's music and it's film and it's graphic design and it's authors and publishers and on and on and on. And so that is how I ended up practicing this area of the law. And 10 years ago, uh, after practicing with a small firm who was great to kind of help me get things started and, and get me on my feet. I started my own firm. I started Creative Law Network uh, back in 2012. So you're kind of living your best life. You're doing music. You're living in a great town and a great community. You're connecting with great artists that you can make things work on many media, including visual. And I'm assuming you're still skiing. I am still skiing. <laughs> I am so definitely still skiing. So I'm going to bridges then after the, the great kind of uh, 
a pivoting innovation lens you've had of your own life as to how to add capabilities, learn by doing, and then add that in uh, with great creatives. Let's then talk about that with what's happening with innovation. There's so much, and we've got five years of this podcast talking about innovation stepping in to change music. And in some cases, it's people coming from the artist lens, which are kind of coming from the the management lens on that side, or they're coming from the technology lens and they see, oh, we need to have this change. And then, the, and somebody pilots it and experiments it. And then sometimes it gets to be a common sort of language of business and changing contracts and changing the way we work. What are you seeing as kind of elements of innovation that need attention from a legal point of view or that might be ones where you look at it and you go, ah, opportunity, or ah, trouble. <laughs> well, if the ones that need attention from a legal point of view is probably all of them, uh, because unfortunately, in general, the law is the last one at the party. The law does not change quickly. It is not nimble. Uh, easy example the copyright law, so copyright governs all sorts of creative works, right? It's when we own a piece of music, it's because we own the copyright. Copyright law was last significantly revi or revised in 1976, okay? Now, we've made little changes along the way, and we will always keep doing that, but the process is slow. Usually, Congress will ask the Copyright Office to make to do research, write a report, make recommendations. They'll take that into consideration. Sidebar, Congress has other things to do, right? So it's not top of their list. Um, and not to say the law has not changed since 76, but for example, uh, when we have issues where uh, there's an infringement of music online and we want that music taken down, we submit a takedown notice. That came from something called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. That's from 1998. I'd say the internet has changed a little bit since then, right? And so uh, we, and there actually was a Music Modernization Act uh, a few years ago, right? It was 2018, I believe. And that gave us um, the MLC that, you know, so we have those innovations, right? But it's not like, oh, NFTs, let's go change the law for NFTs. Oh, we're, you know, we're, we're ch we have AI creating music. Let's go change the law for AI. It just, it doesn't happen that quickly. And what we end up doing a lot of the time is we take the law that we have and we try and mix it and mash it and figure out what does it say about this new thing that the law didn't know about when we drafted that law. So I have a dorky non-lawyer question. So I'm a regular person wanting to start a new technology company. How do I figure out what new things are already out there bending and bending the law or how do I figure out what tripwires I could be walking into? Is there a great, I'm assuming not every music lawyer can wrestle well with the challenges of innovation and law. Yeah, I think that's true. I think, but to answer your question about if you are that person that really wants to um, be a disruptor or come up with something new, what I mean, my role when I'm working with clients like that is to say, OK, well, this is what the law says. And most innovators are going to part of the creative process is to look at what else is out there. Right. We don't want to do if someone's already the doing it. Don't, though. What's that? <laughs> many don't. I run into to, to music <laughs> innovators and they go, I'm doing X. No one's done it before. I said, may I introduce you to six companies? And those really? are just the ones I know off the top of my head. So there's I mean, a lot of not Google, doing. Google's a great tool. Google I gotta is tell your ya. friend, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, but, but here's the thing. I will say what we will do when dealing with innovation, we will try and say, okay, what's close? Who else is doing something similar? How are they doing it? What successes have they have? What failures have they had? Um, and there is also when, um, for better or worse, what often ends up happening from the legal side is it's like, maybe we don't know and we just have to take the risk. A lot of, I, honestly, a lot of my job as a lawyer is talking to clients about risk, right? What is the risk of this path? What is your risk tolerance? 
right? Because it's not my job to make decisions for my clients. It's my guy, my job to counsel my clients, right? Lawyers are counselors. Um, and so let's evaluate the landscape. Let's see how it applies. Let's play it out in a few different scenarios and, and, and then talk about, let's try and think a few steps down the road. If this, this, and this happens, where are we? And every client is, I mean, every project, every innovator, every client is different when it comes to that. So if I'm a, a an artist and I'm taking a look at innovation, I tend to think from my experiences mm -hmm. that artists have the option with a new tech to legally license with realizing that I may or may not get paid out on this license because there may not be revenue that's necessarily attached with a new tech. Um, I could use a new tech as a service to be able to create music. And then I'm thinking, will this be around when I even want to do something a year from now on it? Or potentially I'm taking somebody to court because they're grabbing my music to use in a new tech. Are those the sort of three normal scenarios or what other sort of scenarios from the artist's point of view mm. are the opportunities or challenges with new technology? I think it depends on which side of the technology the artist is on. Uh, it came out weird. Which side of technology the artist is on or which side of the innovation the artist is on because there are certainly folks who want to be on the cutting edge, who want to be testing and trying and experimenting and failing. And there's others who are kind of playing it safe and saying, well, someone else has done this. Now I feel okay doing it. Um, certainly when it comes to using third party technology, we are, as you said, there's a risk. Is that technology going to be around? That's a risk. But, uh, and, but also the person who is more on the cutting edge, more willing to uh, try new things is going to have a higher risk tolerance probably is going to be more comfortable taking that risk that the technology may not be around. And the person who wants to sit back and wait, they're going to be a safe, in a safer position with less risk. So what, what type of things do you see with your clients? Oh man, I see a lot of contracts, <laughs> which is good. We like contracts. Contracts protect us. They're good tools to have. Um, and, I think when it comes to the, I mean, when it comes to the technology side of things, I see really, I, just, I see the spectrum of kind of what I was just saying, where I see the spectrum of people who are comfortable or uncomfortable with those, that experimentation. And I think what's the other side of it from the, from my seat that is interesting is going back a moment to the copyright law, bending the rules trying new things that the rules don't know how to handle, right? So AI is an easy example, okay? Because we have AI that is creating music, that is creating visual art. The Copyright Office has told us that a creative work that is created by a computer or not created by a human is not subject to copyright protection. The computer cannot own a copyright. Okay. When, when and how is that framed? Because I thought that was still a loose... Edge. It is. It is. Well, the reason it's loose is because it's not only up to the copyright office. Copyright office, you apply to the copyright office for copyright protection, and they will grant it or not, right? And so, but these, this is one of these things where it's like the we need to study this. We need to figure out a solution because it's not going away. We're going to have oh, no, more and more AI running into created. a new tool every two days right now. Right. Right. Exactly. And so the problem is. Who owns those AI created works? Now, what the, if you are someone who is, let's say, wanting to use an AI tool to create music, okay, you can go and, surely we can go and do that. We can act like we own that music that we create because we say, well, we had the input, right? It's our input into that, into that uh, tool. And we're going to go treat that like it's our own. Now, you were saying a little before about licensing the rights to this stuff. Well, we look at who created that AI and what do the terms for that AI say? What, who, do, who does own the output from that AI? A lot of people don't realize how um, ever-present contracts are in our lives. And the example I can give you is 
every time you download an app, every time you visit a website, every time you're using a digital tool, you are agreeing to a contract. If you go to a website, you'll see at the very bottom, there's like terms and conditions, but it says terms of service. You click on that link, you'll get a whole bunch of contract language. It says you are using so this website. So it's a very one-sided can edit contract hmm. that you're coming in saying, oh, yeah. yes, implicitly by my using this website at this moment in time, its terms of service are valid for me, but the website has the unilateral ability to change its terms of service and right. hopefully notify you, but maybe not. Maybe. And you are still kind of in the boat when you click that you've sent your implicitly. I, I see the terms of service and I agree though. No one reads them. Nobody reads. I write them. Nobody reads them. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> uh, but that's exactly right. And this actually is important because there's so many concepts in the law that uh, can be confused because it's very easy to think of a contract as a piece of paper that two parties negotiate and everybody signs it at the bottom. Yes, that is one type of contract. But a license is also a contract. Terms of service is a contract. Privacy, a, a privacy policy is like a contract. So I'm using the term more broadly, but these are all documents. It's all language that bind us, that, are, that control how we do things or what we can or cannot do. And so when you go and find this tool, like going back, there's an AI tool that's going to help me create music. There should be terms of service that come with that tool, ideally, that are going to dictate who owns what from the output from that tool. And it's an interesting question because, okay, I use a digital audio workstation and that DAW, I use a plugin and that plugin uses AI or some kind of machine learning piece of it. I wouldn't conceptually think that the DAW should have a right to have any kind of royalty stream for my work. But if you keep going down that rabbit hole, um, that Unity and Unreal, if I'm un remembering correctly, take rev share off your revenue but they don't own the what so you have a there's other pieces of contracts here that you might have then residuals of some kind that are now part of a lot of these more modern creative tools in this lovely creator economy and for those who are listening you're not seeing my air quotes that i'm putting on it uh, but the creator economy is a lot of people putting out um, you know, the shovels for the gold miners who are then off creating where they may or may not have any rights or that you've got, you know, you're paying in, in your, I'm spending a lot of time right now creating in unity, which is a whole other crazy thing I'm working on right now. So that you're, you're bringing in assets, including audio assets that are from all sorts of places and then putting them all together and depending on what that music side is, you may or may not then have, you know, you've got all these puzzle pieces because we're generally not creating a piece of content from I'm voice recording myself or doing an original instrumentation. So we've got this new kind of new ish layer cake of inputs and AI is now part of many of them. Or it could be that I'm having it do the whole thing, which is some of the new pitches. It's, you know, here's a completely or AI reconstructed piece. So mm -hmm. then you get to the question of, you know, who owns the underlying, and this, uh, this is a rabbit hole I go down with people a lot right now. Who owns the training data? And did I license anything about the training data? And so there are people who are using hip hop music as training data and creating new hip hop artists, or they're going in and using YouTube videos as training data. So what's the case law or, or, or hot stones in the road with training data and AI? Well, I think one thing I, I want to make sure to cover quickly from what you were saying is the distinction between ownership and revenue or royalties. Mm -hmm. Right, because there can, there's a, a common, I'd say, misconception that those have to be married together. That if you're going to get some revenue from it, that means you have ownership in it. And that is absolutely not the case. So I deal with this frequently with um, producer agreements. Right, So an artist hires a producer. The producer is helping to create this sound recording or this master. And generally, what the law says is that if multiple people create a copyright work, they're co-owners of that work. But for a standard producer deal, 
you're going to have a producer and artist creating the sound recording. The artist is going to own that sound recording, even though the producer will get a royalty from it. So the producer will get a percentage of the revenue that is generated by that copyrighted work, that sound recording, but they don't necessarily have ownership of it. So even if you are working with Unreal, if you're working with any sort of engine uh, or technology or person that is helping you create, that doesn't mean that they necessarily get any ownership percentage, even if they are going to be due some of the money. And ownership is really important because that's how we control what happens to those creative works, what they go do in the world. Uh, Another reason to have things in writing. Hey, you're doing my job for me. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I say it a lot. Yes, we want things in writing. Contracts are, are, are great tools. And I'll also very briefly say a contract doesn't have to be a super complicated document full of a bunch of legal mumbo jumbo. But a contract just has to tell a story about a deal and include the important deal points. Um the, actually, in law school, in your contracts class, if you went to law school, do not go to law school. I'm not encouraging you to go to law school. But if you did and you went and you sat in your contracts class, you would hear there's a case. We have case law about these guys in a bar. They wrote a contract on a bar napkin. And the court found that that contract, that bar napkin was an enforceable contract. Now, I do not encourage people to write contracts on bar napkins. I do not encourage people to write contracts bars, in bars. Yes. Draw the, no, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the point is, yes, contracts don't need to be intimidating. And to your point, I, yes, you want to have it in writing, whatever the deal is with the people or things that you are creating with or with whom you are creating. On both sides. And, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you don't, so, so I am both the artist or whoever is actually owning what becomes the underlying copyright. I would like to have it not just be verbally and implicit, but I would like to have it, you know, work for hire contract or whatever it is with the parties I'm working with, as well as I want to, if I'm one of the parties, not just take a standard contract and take it, but realize you also have some options there. That could be another two hours talking about the... <laughs> You know, band, band <laughs> contracts and all the other fun stuff that goes we with can that. Do that next time. But yes, you're absolutely right. And yes, those things are entirely, these things are negotiable, but having the deal points in writing protects everybody. Because, and so it's interesting, well, to me as a lawyer, it's interesting that verbal contracts can be enforceable, but in copyright. So for musicians and creatives, the transfer of a copyright or the exclusive license of a copyright. So if there is a work for hire where I'm hiring you to do the work and I'm going to own the work, or if it's an exclusive license, like a record deal where they have the exclusive license to, to produce that music or sorry, to reproduce that music that has to be in writing. So as I say, copyright law is one of these areas, the law where to be enforceable, it must be in writing. So verbal contracts, can be enforceable, but not in these copyright situations. So with new technologies then, um, I know that one of the issues that people have had is that, you know, we might be talking about tiny amounts of initial revenue, mm -hmm. and yet they're going to be having to pay lawyers on both sides to document it. And then, and then some new tech folks are not quite sure why in the world uh, labels or people who own libraries don't want to mess with every single technology that walks in the door because they're, and they're not going to sign your standard contract you hand to them. And so you end up having, you know, it's not costless to step in and say, okay, we'll do something as a pilot. Um, are there things that you've run into in that realm with clients on either side? Sure. I mean, I've certainly run into the situation you're describing. And it is, and, and funding legal fees is always an issue, right? not always, is frequently an issue, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, tr look, we try and come up with creative solutions. Um, and that is really why I got into practicing law to begin with, right? It was because I needed a lawyer and I couldn't find one, that, you know, so I became one basically. Um, and so there, there can be, I mean, I think if you're in that situation where you see there is a need for a lawyer, but maybe you're not sure of the budget for legal, it should be a conversation. I mean, I always tell people if you're, 
going, considering hiring a lawyer, you should be able to interview them, ask about their fees, ask about what's this going to cost. You're, you're hiring a service provider, in my opinion, anyway, and you should have the right to, to interview as many as you want. And I do that. I mean, the, for our firm anyway, we do free consultations for anybody because I would not expect you to pay me until you get to talk to me and tell me and I decide whether you like what I'm talking about. So at that and in that conversation, we can talk about, OK, here's my project. What do you think it's going to cost? That should be part of the conversation. So, Dave, what other type of tripwires around innovation and music do you run into? I think one of the common pitfalls in innovation and in music separately and together is when you have multiple people working on something together, there should be a clear agreement about the deal among those people. And it can be hard because a lot of times we don't know where we're going to end up. We don't know where we're going. And ultimately, part of my job is to think about all the different possibilities and then make sure we're covering all those possible scenarios so that when that great new thing that you did hits, when it takes off, we're not then scrambling to figure out who owns what and who gets paid what because we dealt with it at the front end. So really having, and those can be tough conversations, but it's an important conversation to have because it saves so much heartache and unfortunately legal bills when you have to fight about it later. So that's There's another one, one I'm going to bring up because I just ran into my, so I, one of my good acquaintances has now um, sold and bought back two different companies <laughs> For selling his creative technology company to people who proved to be, I'll put it as jerks. Okay. And so essentially bought back their child. And I was, I had lunch with a long friend I haven't seen forever who did the same thing. He had a creative technology company where he then thought this is the right place for this new technology and creative system to go that had IP attached and, and then once sold ended up not well his issue was different which is also a legal issue because he signed a a uh, a non-compete and uh, other things and so he sold his child to people who were not people he was happy with and then he personally was attached to it for time i'm assuming you run into some of these puzzle pieces um are, are there things that other than spending time with people and realizing that they're they are jerks or that they have something that you don't like that they're going to do with your content. Is there anything in terms of, there's a lot of people, they, they, they create these things so they can have a buyout that that's their, their planned exit strategy um, to sort of think about some of these puzzle pieces. If you have an innovation and you're hoping that someone will cash you out to think earlier. I know this is a very maternal thing. Don't <laughs> sell your company to jerks, and this would be fine. But right. uh, anything for legally to think about with that, or, or setting it up well? well? I think, yeah, I think it really de it will depend on the transaction, because what, because I think when you're in that situation where you're contemplating the sale of a technology or of a business, that what is your relationship with that person or that company, the people who hopefully will not be jerks. Right. And is there, can we do any sort of, uh, dry run? Can we do any sort of test period? Can we ease our way into it? Sometimes we can, but this is also true. I mean, this is true in deals in general. Now, when someone sends me a contract and says, Hey, can you look at this contract? My first question is, tell me the story. Who is this person? How did they find you or how did you find them? What has your interaction been like so far? What does it feel like? What are you thinking? What's your gut on this? It's not rote. It's not just sticking you know, things in the right boxes. It's like it, it's more. It's a more creative process, or it can be anyway. So it is hard in the in the kind of prototypical sale of a business to an outside party. It's hard to put in those clawbacks. Uh, because once it's gone, it's gone. It's like you sell your car to someone, they go crash the car, not much, you got paid, there's nothing you can do about it. Now, if it's more like um, something a little closer to your heart, let's say you have a dog and you can't keep the dog in your house anymore. You moved into an apartment that doesn't allow dogs, but you can give it 
to your friend and you'll have visitation rights with your dog. Okay, so is there a way when you're granting this technology to this new person, can we have visitation rights? Can we maintain, and it's so, you can, do you have a seat on the board, right? I don't know how big this company is, but the purchasing company has a board, you have a seat on the board. You have some sort of right of consultation. You have some sort of say in the next generation. It goes in a lot of different ways. Um, and so that's where it's kind of case by case. Well, we've had a great conversation with this and made me then think about every contract in my life. And, and um, <laughs> it does remind me of a story. So I've, I've, I've come off and now 12 years of teaching music industry students at UCLA. And, and I always comment that um, every band and every new business should, um, should assume that they need to essentially structure in a prenup that all companies with very few exceptions end. And so for me and me being a banker for 10 years, I was very much doing a lot of workouts of things that go wrong. And so it's always like, so what's the end game of any deal, contract, band, music group, venue, when you close <laughs> and when you end, who decides right. and when do you leave? Right. And I would say the innovation, it, it's even more open-ended because you don't know where you, you hypothesize where it's going with a new tech, but you don't really know what the takeout looks like. Um, any insights or words of wisdom in the when when thing when the when the doors close things to think about earlier or examples? Yes, well, I think the band is a great example because yes, we want the band to have a band agreement, and the hardest conversation in drafting that band agreement is what happens when somebody leaves because it's gonna happen, right? There's how many bands out there have the same members from the beginning? It's pretty rare, and what I but however. That's a hard conversation because it contemplates something bad happening, right? It contemplates the band breaking up. And I always tell band members, I'm like, think about this as if you're the person leaving as well as if you're the person staying. Because everyone thinks, oh, it's not going to be me that leaves. If you end up being the person leaving, how would you want them to be treated? The other thing I tell people, not just bands, but 